Thank you, Regina, for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm delighted and honoured as a Leitrim person to be speaking here at the Sean McDermott the Summer School this year. And uh, I have been to the cottage uh, outside Kilty Clara on many different occasions and I would thoroughly recommend to anybody uh, watching in today who hasn't been to see the Sean McDermott the homestead please do go and visit it during the summer it's in a beautiful location in a beautiful county and it's the only extant uh, homestead of uh, one of the signatories of the uh, proclamation which is still standing. I have called my uh, talk here today the miracle of Irish independence. Many people don't see Irish independence uh, as a miracle. They see it as a historic inevitability. I respectfully disagree and I'm going to explain the reasons why I think that is now. But if history teaches us anything, it teaches us that there is nothing inevitable. Look around the world today and you will see countries that may have as much a claim as ourselves to sovereignty. Scotland, Catalonia, Quebec, Wales, but they're not sovereign, independent countries. If you ask people in 1921, would Ireland be united by now? They would probably say it's inevitable. Even James Craig, the architect of Northern Ireland, believed that partition might last for one or maybe two generations. I believe that there was a unique set of circumstances a hundred years ago which presented themselves and led in short to an independent Ireland. These circumstances were historic in nature and presented a once in a millennium opportunity for Ireland to separate from Britain. In beginning my talk, I will make the distinction between home rule and republicanism or what I call separatism. The distinctions are important. From the Act of Union in 1800 when Ireland became part of the United Kingdom, the majority of people in Ireland sought the return of their own parliament. In 1870, the Home Rule Movement was set up by Isaac Butt, leading to the Home Rule Party of the 1870s. Far Parnell famously said that no man could has the right to set the boundaries of a nation. But in reality, the Home Rule Party wanted just that, Home Rule. They wanted Irish control of our solely Irish affairs, but critically, Ireland would remain a part of the United Kingdom. This was true for the three Home Rule Bills of 1886, 1893 and 1912. While the measures of freedom granted to Ireland was different in these three bills, the end outcome would remain the same. Ireland would remain a part of the United Kingdom. It would not have a separate foreign policy. It would not have its own army or navy, its own currency, its own flag. The Irish Parliament would not be sovereign. Instead, it would be subject to the Westminster Parliament, which had the power to overthrow Irish laws. The Royal Irish Constabulary, the Postal Savings Bank and the collecting of taxes were all reserved matters for Westminster under the 1912 Home Rule Bill. The Irish government could raise taxes but it would mean less of a block grant from Westminster. This bill only offered limited self-government and asserted the supreme authority of the UK Parliament over all persons, matters and things in Ireland. This was not independence. And yet, in April 1912, when the Third Home Rule Bill was first introduced into the House of Parliament, tens of thousands of people turned up in O'Connell Street. The first speaker was John Redmond, the Irish Party leader who had championed Home Rule since he had taken over the party in 1900. The second speaker was Owen McNeill, who would go on to found the Irish Volunteers, which had a critical role in the War of Independence. There's no government so bad, he said, that it would not be better for the Irish people to accept it if they themselves were in charge of it. And one of the third speakers speaking only in Irish was a little known speaker at the time by the name of Patrick Pearce. We have no wish to destroy the British, he said. We only want our freedom. We differ among ourselves on small points, but we agree that we want freedom in some shape or another. But I should think myself a traitor to my country if I do not answer the summons of this gathering, for it is clear to me that the bill we support today will be good for Ireland and that we'll be, we will be stronger with it than without it. Let us unite and win a good act from the British. I think it can be done. The bill as I have explained, offered only limited self-government and asserted the supreme authority of the UK Parliament over all persons, matters and things in Ireland. In truth, the Irish public were resigned and reconciled to the prospect of home rule after more than a century of direct rule from Westminster. 
Nothing illustrates this fact more than the by-election in North Leitrim in 1908 when the incumbent, Charles Dolan, resigned his seat as an Irish party MP and stood as the Sinn Féin candidate in its first election. The election is remembered as Sean McDermott there was his election agent, yet he only polled a third of the vote in a two-horse race. Arthur Griffith's message of abstentionism from the British Parliament, his dual monarchy and economic self-reliance was a message the people were not ready for. There are a number of factors that led eventually to Irish independence. It's each of these, if each of these events had not happened, Irish history would have taken a different course. The first was the People's Budget of 1909. This was by an attempt by the Dane, Chancellor of the Exchequer David Lloyd George, to introduce a welfare state and soak the British rich, who he despised. This created a huge constitutional crisis in Britain because the Lords voted it down. The Liberal government threatened to create hundreds of peers to overcome the inbuilt Tory majority. When the Lords voted down the people's budgets, two elections, general elections, were held in the UK in 1920. Ten. In the second one, it ended in a tie between the Liberal and Conservatives. Critically, it allowed the Irish Party to hold the balance of power and they had one item on the agenda and that item was Home Rule. In 1911, the Irish Party helped the Liberals pass one of the most important pieces of legislation in British history, the Parliament Act. This actually turned Britain into a representative democracy, ensuring that the unelected chamber could not thwart the will of the government as expressed through the ballot box. Critically, it also meant that when the Home Rule Bill was introduced into the House of Commons in 1912, it was certain to pass, and here's the rub, only if the same bill was introduced into the House of Commons on three different occasions on three separate years, as the Home Rule, as the House of Lords still had the power to delay legislation in three separate sittings of Parliament. This was critical to its actual failure because had the Home Rule Act become law in 1912 it would have done so before the foundation of the Ulster Volunteers or the Irish Volunteers, in other words before the gun came back into Irish politics. By the time 1914 came around and the Act was become law there were two armed militias in Ireland and no chance of a peaceful settlement. The July 1914 conference in which Lloyd George offered Ulster an opt out for six years was rejected by Carson and Craig. But the most important catalyst for Irish change in these years was the First World War. This was the event that brought empires to the knees, ended the old order and created dozens of new nations, large and small, including, of course, Ireland. It was also the most important event of this period when we look at Irish history. Two events occurred in September 1914 which would change the course of Irish history. The first was the Home Rule Act was given royal assent on the 18th of September 1914 and therefore became the law of Britain, yet its implementation was suspended for the duration of the war, which many people thought would be a short war. As important in that month though was the decision by the Supreme Council of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the IRB, to stage a revolt against British war rule in Ireland during the Great War. As Sean T. O'Kelly remembered years later, it was decided that a rising should take place in Ireland if the German invade, army invaded Ireland, secondly if England attempted to enforce conscription on Ireland and thirdly if the war were coming to an end and the rising had not already taken place. We should rise and revolt, declare war on England and when the conference was held to settle the terms of peace we should claim to be represented as a belligerent nation. I won't go into all the planning of the rising but it's important to state that the Easter rising was an event which happened in the First World War and not just during the First World War. Without the First World War there would have been no Easter Rising. Without the Rising there would have been no War of Independence and therefore no independent Irish state. All of these events are linked. And why? Because the rebels knew there was no chance of a favourable settlement if Britain had no distractions abroad and therefore could give the Irish Rebellion its full attention. If you go to the First World War exhibition in the Imperial War Museum, you'll find the recreation of trenches and Tommy guns, and you'll also find a copy of the Patrick Pierce surrender notice. The British Empire saw the Easter Rising as part of the war. It explains its response to it, especially its disastrous decision to execute the leaders of the Easter Rising. Bear in mind that the British did not execute the leaders of the 1848 or 1867 rebellions. The Easter Rising leaders were not 
executed for staging a rebellion against Britain. They were executed for taking part in an armed rebellion and in waging war against His Majesty the King. As we know, the Easter Rising was not a military triumph, but it was much more than that. It was a triumph of will. It awoke the Irish people to the realisation that they were settling for something less than what they were entitled to through the Home Rule process. And I think this was perhaps the greatest triumph of the leaders of the rebellion, and including, of course, Sean McDermott. It's important to understand another unrecognised reason for the rising. In the years between 1870 and 1914, there was much in the way of social progress in Ireland. You had the various land acts from 1870, especially the Wyndham Act of 1903, transferring the land of Ireland to the people of Ireland. There was the 1891 Congested Districts Act, the 1898 Local Government Act, which ended landlord control of local authorities, the 1908 Irish University Acts, which set up a university acceptable to the Catholic majority in Ireland, and the Labourers Act of 1904, which built 40,000 cottages in the Irish countryside in the years before the First World War. And the Chief Secretary to Ireland, Augustine Burrell, was regarded as a fairly enlightened fellow by the standards of British politicians at the time. The critical thing for many of the rebels in this time period is not that the British were ruling Ireland badly, but that they were ru ruling Ireland too well. Advanced nationals feared that benign br rule from Britain was much to be feared as despotic rule. The fear was that if the material wants of the Irish people were sa satisfied, they would be permanently reconciled to British rule. The enthusiasm displayed in Ireland for the British war effort convinced many advanced nationalists that only a dramatic gesture would turn the tide. This was captured many years later by Desmond Fitzgerald, one of the those who had been in the GPO in 1916 and the father of Garrett Fitzgerald. He said, The Rising was launched by men for whom, in the autumn of 1914, the volunteer movement and not to all our dreams had centred seemed merely to have canalised the martial spirit of the Irish people for the defence of England. Our dream castles topped upon us with a crash. It was brought home to us that the very fever that had possessed us was due to a subconscious awareness that the final end of the Irish nation was at hand. This might sound like hyperbole, but look at the case of Scotland. It's a little known fact that there was also a Home Rule Bill for Scotland uh, on the horizon in 1913. In fact, in May 1913, the House of Commons passed a second reading of the I Government of Scotland Act. Um, the bill was supported by the Liberals and opposed by the Unionists, and it did not proceed any further because of the First World War. What happened to the bill? None of the countries of the UK suffered more in the First World War than Scotland, and 134,000 men were killed, three times the Irish rate from a similar population. The bonds of blood occasioned by the First World War swept away the desire, Scottish desire for home rule for generations afterwards and it was only achieved in 1998. The same could have happened in Ireland. I've heard it said by John Bruton and others that the Easter Rising was unnecessary. In the autumn 2014 issues of study, Bruton stated, Ireland could have achieved better results for all the people of this island if it had continued to follow this successful non-violent parliamentary path and had not embarked on a path of physical violence initiated by the IRB and the Irish Citizen Army in Easter week of 1916. I believe, Bruton continued, Ireland would have reached the position it is today an independent nation of 26 or 28 counties if it had stuck with the Home Rule policy and if the 1916 rebellion had not taken place. It's one thing to argue about the morality of violence in the East arising in the War of Independence. It's quite another thing to say that Irish independence would have come about without it. The best repast to this revisionist and ultimately counterfactual version of Irish history was given by uh, Bruton's Fine Gael predecessor as Thysia Garth Fitzgerald. Writing in the Irish Times in 2006, Fitzgerald said Bruton's vision was alternative history gone mad. He explained, it does not follow that home rule would have led peacefully onwards to Irish independence. He advances two reasons for this. Both are worth quoting in full. There's little reason to believe that Britain would have permitted Ireland to secure independence peacefully, at least until many decades after the Second World War. 
Secondly, long before this point could have been reached, the growth of the welfare state within the United Kingdom, of which Ireland remained a part, would have involved a scale of financial transfers from Britain to Ireland that would have made the whole of our island even more financially dependent on Britain than Northern Ireland is today. By the time the Brit that Britain might finally have been prepared peacefully to have concede our independence to our part of Ireland, the financial cost of such a separation would have been so great for our people, probably entailing a drop of 25% or more in living standards. That's highly unlikely that the Irish people would have been prepared to accept such a sudden and huge drop in their standard of living. The truth is that we got out from under British rule just in time at a moment when the cost of the break was still bearable, involving as it did only a small reduction in public service salaries and in the very limited social welfare provisions of that period. Imagine if you will an alternative scenario if the Easter Rising had not happened and the Home Rule Parliament met in Dublin in 1919 and everything else stayed the same. It would probably take at least 10 years for that Parliament to bed in, by which time you're right in the middle of the Great Depression. In the 1930s you have the rise of Hitler making the fate of small and nations very nervous about separation. The 1940s are out because of the Second World War and then in the 1950s you have the post-war boom and the setting up of the NHS, the expanded welfare state etc. Undoubtedly there would always be a strong separatist tendency in Ireland which might win out. It may seem fanciful that Irish people would put their pocket before their heart when it comes to Irish independence but you only have to see a lot of the commentary around the prospect of United Ireland and the cost, costs involved to know that this is exactly what can happen sometimes. <clears throat> people are in favour, but people are in favour of the United Ireland, but are they willing to pay for it? For me, the aftermath of the First World War also provided an opportunity for Irish independence. Firstly, had Germany won the First World War, it's unlikely Britain would have granted any measure of independence to Ireland. Secondly, Britain suffered terribly in the First World War, even though it was one of the victors. It had almost 800,000 men killed and had inherited a number of mandates and unrest across the empire, which led to imperial overstretch and made Ireland a much bigger problem than it would have done had there been no First World War. It wanted peace and it wanted a settlement in Ireland. When I speak about the miracle of Irish independence, I mean the unique set of circumstances I spoke of earlier. The Home Rule Act, the setting up of the Irish Volunteers, the First World War, the Easter Rising and the rise of self-determination as outlined by Woodrow Wilson in his 14 points. Had any of these factors been absent, the history of Ireland would be different. When I speak about the miracle of Irish independence, I also mean the victory of the IRA in the War of Independence. Yes, I know the conventional wisdom is that the truce of 1921, which ended the War of Independence, was a draw, but I don't see it that way. I disagree. By staying in the fight as long as it did, the IRA and forcing, by staying in the fight as long as it did, and by forcing the British to the negotiation table, the IRA triumphed. And this was, despite, this was despite being perennially short of guns. By the early summer of 1921, the IRA was under severe strain. More than 4,000 men were in jail, including 19 brigade commanders and 90 battalion commanders. According to the author Paul McMahon, the IRA was down to 2,000 active fighters and had only 569 rifles, 477 revolvers and 20 bullets for rifle. It was a pitiful arsenal to bear against the might of the British Empire and many within the British security establishment, especially the Chief of the Imperial General Staff, Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson, believed that one more push would finish the murder gang once and for all. But for British making terms with the Irish was not a military defeat as much as a moral and political one. The British were not defeated militarily as such. Indeed, they only lost the equivalent of one day in the uh, First World War during the War of Independence. But by negotiating terms with de Valera and Collins, they recognised that the great majority of Irish people were in sympathy with the aims of the IRA, even if they weren't always in agreement with their methods. The measure of freedom won through the treaty was far in advance of that of, home, of the Home Rule Act and constituted, constituted a vindication of those who believed that Ireland deserved more than just limited self-government.
the price of Irish independence was partition. When the treaty was signed in December 1921, it was universally expected by even anti-treaty politicians that the Border Commission set up under Clause 12 of the treaty would return the counties of Fermanagh and Tyrone, the city of Derry and South Armagh to the Irish Free State, therefore rendering Northern Ireland unviable as a political proposition. But the hopeless wording around the Border Commission, when a plebiscite should have been called, guaranteed where we are at today. As I said before, nation forming is incredibly hard, especially for small countries, and usually only occurs as a result of cataclysmic events. There were two great periods of nation forming in the 20th century. The first was in the aftermath of the First World War. The second was after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. Because nation building is so difficult, in my opinion, the Scots made a monumental mistake in not voting for independence in 2014. And yet, despite Brexit and the success of the Scottish National Party, it remains today a 50-50 nation. Projecting forward, it may take another unique set of circumstances for Ireland to finally achieve a unification. A possible scenario I would envisage is a minority Labour government uh, propped up by the SNP which demands as the price of support a second referendum in Scotland. An independent Scotland could lead if the Scottish people were to vote again for an end and if the <clears throat> at the second available opportunity if the Scottish people were to vote for independence I believe that the clamour for a border poll in Ireland would become unstoppable. And such a poll I think could happen. Uh, I think as your previous speaker Bertie Ahern once said uh, in 2028 the 30th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. If not then then when? We've learned from the Brexit referendum that we must prepare for such a scenario properly and in a grown-up fashion. Last year in the Irish Times I proposed that a forum on the future of Ireland envisaging all scenarios, a united Ireland, the status quo or some form of joint sovereignty, if such a thing existed, should take place. I note that there are many people who are already engaged in the serious arguments over a united Ireland, how much it would cost, how much it would When I speak about the miracle of Irish independence, I also mean the victory of the IRA in the War of Independence. Now, yes, I know the conventional wisdom is that the truce was a draw. Uh, yes, I know the conventional wisdom is that the truce of 1921, which ended the War of Independence, was effectively a draw. But I think by staying in as long as they did and forcing the British to the negotiation table, it amounted to a victory for the IRA, and this is despite the fact that they were perennially short of guns. By the summer of 1921, the IRA was under severe strain. It had 4,000 men were in jail, including 19 brigade commanders and 90 battalion commanders. And according to the author Paul McMahon, the IRA was down to 2,000 active fighters, 569 rifles, 477 revolvers and 20 rounds per rifle. This was a pitiful arsenal to bring against the might of an empire, and there were many within the British security, many within the British security establishment, most notably chief, the chief of the Imperial General Staff, uh, Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson, who believed that one more push would get rid of what he described as the murder gang. For the British, it was not just a military defeat. For the British it wasn't a military defeat but it was a political and a moral one. The British were not defeated militarily as such but in negotiating terms with de Valera and Collins they recognised that the great majority of Irish people at the time were in sympathy with the aims of the IRA even if they didn't always agree with their methods. So the measure of freedom that was won through the Anglo-Irish Treaty was far in advance of that of the Home Rule Act, including the Government of Ireland Act 1920, which some people have described as the Fourth Home Rule Act, which again would have retained uh, um, all of Ireland in the United Kingdom. The Anglo-Irish Treaty was a vindication of those who believed that the Irish people should not settle for the limited uh, strictures of Home Rule. In our recent 1921 supplement, Professor Colin Kenny, who's written a well-received biography 
of Arthur Griffith came across a document which I think is something of a historical scoop. It's a memo drawn up by the Assistant Secretary to the British Cabinet, Tom Jones, following a conversation between Arthur Griffith and Lloyd George in relation to the Boundary Commission. And what's interesting about it is that it states that Northern Ireland can opt out of a, an All-Ireland Parliament. However, and this is noteworthy, it states if Ulster did not see here to accept immediately the principle of a Parliament of All-Ireland, she would continue to be represented in the British Parliament and she would continue subject to British taxation. This is important. This means that the Northern Ireland taxpayers would be paying more uh, than, than what they were paying under the present uh, arrangements as outlined by the Government of Ireland Act. But the most important caveat is, is this. If they opt out of the... Uh, all-Ireland Parliament, however, it would be necessary to revise the boundary of Northern Ireland to make the boundary conform as closely as possible to the wishes of the people. Note what has been said here. In the early discussions, it was stated that if Northern Ireland opted out of an All-Ireland Parliament, that he would lose territory. The eventual Article 12 of the Anglo-Irish Treaty allowed for a three-person border commission, but when it was reported in 1925, it only allowed for a modest uh, exchange of territory between the two two jurisdictions and its recommended its recommendations were scrapped and the border remains in place to this day. Looking back on the events of a hundred years ago, we should be grateful for the foresight and the courage of those who made Irish independence possible. Looking back on the events of a hundred years ago, we should be grateful for the foresight and courage of those who came before us who brought about Irish freedom. Two things legitimised the War of Independence. The first is that violence was a last resort and not a first resort as far as Sinn Féin was concerned. It must be remembered that the first Nationalist Ireland gave an overwhelming mandate for separation from Britain at the 1918 general election. The first act of the first Dáil was to nominate three representatives to go to the Paris Peace Conference and argue the case for an independent Ireland. They never got a hearing. It seems that the rights of small nations applied only to those countries that were from among the vanquished in the First World War and not the victorious. Most historians date the War of Independence to the Solahed Beg ambush which occurred on the same day as the first Dáil. I think this is misleading. In reality, the War of Independence ne did not really begin until January 1920 with the mass attacks on barracks, RIC barracks. And that was in response to repeated uh, British repression, including most notably in September 1919, the banning of Dáil Éireann, which was an outrageous and egregious act uh, against Irish democracy. I think... When we look back on what happened 100 years ago, those involved in the War of Independence, they weren't gunmen and gunwomen, they were Democrats at heart. And they proved that and played their part in ensuring that Ireland has one of the longest continuous democracies in Europe. Secondly, in April 1921, Dáil Éireann agreed to take responsibilities for the actions of the IRA, thus making the IRA the army of the nascent Irish state. One of the remarkable things about the Irish War of Independence is how much was achieved with relatively little bloodshed. According to the uh, newly published book The Dead of the Irish Revolution, the number of IRA combatants who died between 1917 and 1921 was 491. Not all of them died in combat. To put that in perspective, it is approximately 1% of the number of Irish who died in the First World War. By contrast, there are 4,000 Irishmen remembered on the Teep Fowl Memorial to the Missing Alone. And I could name you perhaps a half dozen memorials or graveyards where there are more Irishmen buried than were killed fighting against the British in the War of Independence. Of course, for the families of those involved and for the men themselves, it was the tragedy of a life cut short, for she had the boss or son Neheran. 
to paraphrase Churchill, never in the field of Irish history was so much owed by so many to so few. Thank you.